We've been talking in the month of December about how Christmas is a very unique holiday. It's celebrated by people who have absolutely no religious affiliation at all as a purely secular holiday. And it's celebrated by people who celebrate the birth of Jesus at Christmas. And both use a lot of the same language. But there are roots. There are roots that go deep with this particular holiday. And what we've been talking about in the month of December has been the roots of Christmas. And no matter the language, no matter where you are or where you're from, where you're from, I want you to understand that the roots of Christmas run deep and they are clear. And every once in a while they poke through, even if, even if you're not a religious person, even if this is not something that, that you've really leaned into with your life, they still peek through. You're at the mall, you're in a store, and you hear, Hark the herald angels sing over the speakers. Glory to the newborn king. Newborn king? King of what? Born. Lay his glory by. Born that man no more may die. This is the whole gospel in one song. It's astounding. We sang it earlier. And so many people will hear it and they'll move on and they'll, they'll think about it for a second and then they'll, they'll just move right past it. We've talked in the series about how when Matthew, who's writing his biography of Jesus' life, when he starts, he doesn't start the way so many legendary stories begin. He doesn't start with once upon a time. You remember how he started? He started with a genealogy. One of the most exciting parts of the Bible. A list of names that you can't pronounce, right? One after another, after another, after another, after another, and they keep going. Why does that matter? Well, we talked about how the genealogy grounds Jesus in history. This is not something that was made up. This isn't a legend like the legend of Zeus. It's grounded in history. And we talked about how that is incredibly important to understand that Jesus lived in a time, in a place, with people who were just like us. We look at that genealogy and we understand that there is no moral to the story as Matthew's giving that to us. He's not telling us what to do. He's telling us what God has already done. That is the point as Matthew begins his biography. He lists people in that genealogy that you and I might never have listed in our family tree because you would pick and choose, right? You'd pick and choose who you want to include and maybe, you know, we're not going to include them because, you know, ooh, that, that's a story. And we're not going to tell that at Christmas or Thanksgiving. But Matthew includes them. He includes all these people who are outsiders. They're not ones that you would normally wrap into the fold because he wanted to convey the truth that, that outsiders are invited. That that's what Christmas means. Outsiders are invited. That everyone is invited. Everyone is included. And everyone is wanted. You know how important that message is? It's one we're still talking about 2,000 years later. That everyone is invited. Everyone is included, no matter where they've been or what they've done. Everyone is wanted. We talked in the next week about how of all the world's face, only Christianity announces a God who embraced our pain with us. God with us. The incarnation of Jesus did not happen just so that we know that God exists. It wasn't the point. The point of it was to bring him near. God, come near. So that we know that we can be with him. That's the whole point of the incarnation. That's the whole point of Christmas. Christmas says that God has been where we've been, all the places we've been. And we can trust and we can rely on him because he understands, he knows. And he has the power to comfort and to strengthen and to bring us through. And boy, don't we need that after the season we've just been in these last few years. We looked this last Sunday at the story of Herod and how Herod embodies so many bad things, but that that instinctive human response that we have when we begin to lose control, 
when our control is threatened? Herod embodies that. Christmas is the declaration of war against that darkness that exists in every one of us. Christmas shows that the true king has come. And it's not us. It's not you. It's not me. So these last couple weeks, we've seen what God has done. That's been the whole point. We've seen what God has done, but what's our response to that? How do we respond to what God has done? And so we come to Christmas Eve. So where I want to pick up tonight is maybe a little bit different than what you might have been expecting. It's when Mary is first visited by the angel, Gabriel, and told what's about to happen. Luke records this in his biography of Jesus. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, we've talked about Nazareth. Nazareth is the backside of nowhere. No one wants to be from Nazareth. No one trusts anyone from Nazareth. Nazareth is Hickville. Nobody trusts people from there. They're not credible. Where does Mary live? Nazareth, right. Just want to make sure you're with me, okay? That's where she, that's where she is. Gabriel is sent from God to Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. She's betrothed. They're engaged, but it's way deeper than engagement. Betrothal at this point in history is legally binding. If one of you dies during the betrothal, the other is considered a widow or a widower. It's that binding. But they have not yet come together. They have not yet celebrated the consummation. And so she is still said to be a virgin. And Gabriel comes to her and says, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Now, when an angel shows up, what is your response? Typically fear. And so Gabriel says, Hey, favored, the Lord is with you. Greetings. Greetings. Now, Mary, at this point in history, Right, we know for a betrothal, typically, like for a young girl to be betrothed, they're usually between 12 and 15 years of age. So this is a middle school age girl in our world. Okay? An angel shows up and says this. What's Mary's response? Mary is greatly troubled. <clears throat> this is Luke using what we call understatement. Greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting... This might be. And the angel then says to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Don't be afraid. You found favor with God. And behold, you're going to conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. What a message. My younger daughter is 15 years old, about this age. Can you imagine? Can you imagine receiving this? What is your response to what God has said through his messenger? Mary said to the angel, how exactly is that going to work? That's William's translation. How will this be since I'm a virgin? They knew how it worked. They knew how babies happened, right? How exactly is this going to work? How is this going to happen? How is this even possible, angel? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. This is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And for some of you, that verse is why you're here. And this is a verse you're going to carry with you into 2023 when you begin to doubt and you begin to question and you begin to say, is that even possible? Remember what the angel told Mary. Nothing will be impossible with God. Mary, Mary's response, behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. The angel departed 
from her. Note what the angel originally said to her, right? Highly favored one. Yeah. She gets to be the one who will carry and bear the Messiah, the anointed one, the one they had been praying for and waiting for for hundreds of years, the one that was prophesied about by Isaiah, by Jeremiah, by Ezekiel, by Daniel, and so many others. Highly favored. What's favor? Favor is undeserved, unearned grace from God. That's what it is. Anybody be happy if they receive that? Just three of you? Okay, that's fine. That's fine. You raise your hand, you get it. So I'm just saying, no. In fact, you've all gotten it. You've all gotten it. You know why? Because that's what Christmas is about. The unearned, undeserved grace of God. God sending his son Jesus. Now, the angel comes to Mary and tells her this is what's going to happen. And Mary's first response is, well, how, how's that going to work? How can this be exactly? I want you to see something here that is so often misunderstood. What we are seeing is not blind faith. Scripture never once calls for anyone to have blind faith. Not once. Mary's response reveals her character. She's not asking, Angel, I don't really believe that's possible. You know, Angel, I, I, I just don't see it. Now, if you go back a little bit in Luke's biography of Jesus, you find the husband of Elizabeth that he talked about earlier, the husband named Zechariah, who gets a visit from an angel and is told that your wife's going to bear a son. This will end up being John the baptizer. And... Zachariah's response is, <laughs> yeah, it's funny. We're old. It's not going to happen. He laughs. He says, no way. Mary's response is different. How exactly is that going to work? I'm going to need a little more detail here. This isn't disbelief. This is exploring. See, Mary faced some barriers. Mary faced some barriers here. And the barriers that Mary faces are very similar to the barriers that you and I face. They looked a little bit different for her. But imagine for just a second being a 12 to 15 year old girl in Nazareth, Nowheresville, who all of a sudden is pregnant. She's betrothed, but she's not married. In this day, in this time, in this culture, none of that's okay. Now what? Her family can't believe it. Every tongue in the village is going to be wagging. And Joseph. <laughs> well, Joseph knows it's not his. Now what? Mary's got to deal with all that. If she says yes. She has all of those barriers to faith, all of those barriers to saying yes to what God is bringing to her. I like how Tim, Ke Tim Keller puts this. He says, the barriers Mary faced against belief were every bit as big as the barriers you may be facing. And yet a combination of evidence and experience shattered those barriers, and she came to a place of faith. You know what? That is exactly the way it works now. Mary doubted, she questioned, she used her reason, and she asked questions, just as we must today if we're going to have faith. Too many places, too many people will say, well, you can't ask questions, you can't doubt, you can't ask any questions, you should just believe, blind faith. To that, I want to give you a very simple theological response. That is not what Scripture says. My question is always, what does Scripture say? And what Scripture says is that we are intended to use our minds. God gave them to us. I believe he intends us to use them and not check them at the door. And so we do. We ask questions. We explore. And we're honest about it. 
and we don't pretend to be something that we're not. That's how you come to a place of authentic, transparent faith. That's what we see Mary do, and that's the experience that I went through and many of you have gone through. Not pretending there are no questions, but being honest about the questions that we have. Uh, Again, Keller, he says, some doubt seeks answers. Some doubt is a defense against the possibility of answers. There's a kind of doubt that is the sign of a closed mind, and there's a kind of doubt that is the sign of an open mind. And you know the difference, if you're honest. There is doubt that does not want to hear truth, and there is doubt that seeks truth. What I'm talking about is the latter. Asking honest questions and not being afraid when honest questions are asked. That, that is the new community that Jesus started. That is the new community that we are a part of. I want you to hear so loud and clear. Our response to God's gift of Jesus at Christmas is not blind faith. Absolutely not. It is thoughtful evaluation, acceptance, and trust. That's the process. But that's the process I want for you. We should never be afraid of questions. We should never create an environment where anyone is afraid to ask questions. Questions are okay as long as they're asked with an open mind that seeks truth, not a closed mind that rejects it no matter what. We've been talking in this series about how Christmas really reflects God coming near to us. But I want you to remember what the Apostle James said. And this is a verse that I've asked everyone at Southview to commit to memory during this month. It's a very small, very simple verse. Come near to God, and He will come near to you. This is the invitation that we have at Christmas. This is the invitation that we have at this time of year at when, when more people are open to this than any other time, I think. Will we come near to God? Because if we take a step toward Him, here's what I know. He is ready, able, and willing to take a step toward us. You and I have a Heavenly Father who stands with His arms wide open inviting us to come home. Will you take your step? Every one of us has a next step in faith. I've got next steps in my faith, so do you. Come near to God. Come near to God, James says. And He will come near to you. That's a promise. That's a promise for every one of you this Christmas. My prayer? God, come near. Come near to each one of you. I want to pray that right now for us. Heavenly Father, Christmas can be a time of of so much stress, so much anxiety, so much hustle and bustle and running, running, running. Sometimes we can lose the plot. We can forget what the main point of this is. Tonight, in this moment, may we remember Christmas is about you coming near to us. Not because you had to, not because we earned it, not because we deserved it, but because of your great love for us. And you invite us, invite us to come home, to come near to you. And James gives us this promise. When we do, when we come near, when we come near to you, You will come near to us. I pray that for each person here. Everyone would experience your presence, God, in a unique and fresh, very real way. May we not be afraid of our questions because you're big enough for every one of them. May we always seek truth, no matter what. I pray this together. Asking it in the name of Jesus.